All right, so everyone repeat everything you just said. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll do a real quick recap. So yeah, Missio, very limited space. Uh, twice a week access for our faculty, for our uh, staff, which means that students can make appointments to use the space during those two or three days. I don't know. I think it's, I think it's Tuesdays and Thursdays, but I'm not positive about that because I'm not the one that's on site. Um, so, and as far as I'm aware, unless there's a, you know, the space is already booked up, um, SEPLA students are welcome to use the facility. They just need to contact us beforehand so we can arrange access because it is, um, so we know that they're going to be coming because it is a, we'd have to, um, we have to press a buzzer and we have to kind of let them up because it is a gated building. And then again, just to make sure that somebody's there and that there's not already a limitation on more people. So Lydia, we have a Philly campus, so this, this could happen to us. So what's the, what's the steps that a SEPLA student would need to do if they said, uh, there's a book at Missio that I really need and I'd like to go over and get it. What were the steps you'd want them to take? Uh, just go ahead and send an email to library at, at missio.edu um, and say, I would like to, you know, come get a book, um, you know, on this day, are you there? And if so, what time can I come or something along those lines? Um, and that way we know to expect them uh, to make sure that they can actually get into the building and, you know, to make sure that they're not going to wind up in the middle of a mob on the stairs or something. So, not all that terribly complicated, I hope. <laughs> right. Okay, good. That's super helpful. And, and just sort of as a, an extra, we, we are freely doing interlibrary loans again. Um, there's a little, because we're only on campus twice a week, there's, um, we won't have the, quite the same turnaround for physical items that we were maintaining, but we are you know, 24 hours pretty much for e e-resources and again you know if you can wait a couple days we can do physical items as well are you quarantining books sort of um kind of just by the fact that she's only in twice a week anything that comes in is going to be sitting for a couple days uh, okay. uh, i don't i don't know how sort of stringent she's being um if she was in every day then we would have to have the discussion of you know how are we doing quarantining, but um, basically the, yeah, it's just happening uh, naturally. Okay. What's going on at Westminster? Um, well, um, Westminster, the library reopened. Donna, help me. When did we reopen? Beginning of August? July 27th. July 27th, end of July, beginning of August. Um, in order to reopen, uh, we uh, reduced study space in the library by about 50%. Um, we sectioned off um, a lot of our study space, took away chairs, um, evicted some of our Carroll residents, um, and so, um, we did that. Um, I'm mostly not in the library, so I'll let Donna in a minute talk about what the actual experience has been, but I don't think we've been overrun by people. Yeah. Um, Westminster is going, made the decision back in June to go exclusively online for the next academic year. Oh, wow. Um, so that said, there are still a lot the of The entire our, year, not just the, the entire, semester. The entire year, the entire academic year. What would mean? Uh, so, wow. So from September through to June next year. Yep. Wow. Uh, 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 we're just the library staff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Strange. But do people still live on campus? No, uh, very few. Um, mm -hmm. There's a couple of people. There's 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 typically a handful of international students on campus, but there are very few international students around. So most of them went home. 
-hmm. And the majority of them, I, I think, have not come back. Um, I think part of the rationale for going exclusively online for the full year is because of the large percentage of our student body that comes from China and Korea. Um, and it certainly back in June um, looked very uncertain as to whether or not they would be able to get visas to get back into the country. So I think in the interests of, of that and um, also just because of the general state of the virus in Pennsylvania, the administration took the decision to do the entire academic year um, remotely. Um, there are still a lot of students in the area and um, so we do expect that there will be uh, traffic in the library um, once school starts again. Um, we are going to maintain regular hours. Uh, they will be reduced from what they've typically been. Um, but um, we hope to have hours basically um, Monday to Friday and Saturday. Um, still a bit to be determined depending on our ability to uh, recruit uh, student staff to cover um, evenings and Saturdays. Donna's, Donna's working on that as we speak. So, so that's, that's the overall plan. Um, Donna, do you want to talk about what we're doing with books and stuff? Yeah. We, uh, what we're doing is having all returns go through the book drop, not in-person returns. Uh, we let them sit there overnight, and then in the morning we collect, we collect them wearing a mask and gloves. We also collect anything from the reshelving carts, put that in our workroom, and let it sit another day. And then we check them in the next day or do account use on them. Um, we have in-person checkout. We wear, uh, if we're handling someone's books or uh, library cards, we wear gloves. Um, we're, we're doing, uh, ILL is up and running, although I can't always get to it in a timely manner, but we are lending both physical items and, you know, articles and so forth. Um, the only thing that's been a little weird is our reserves. There's been some use of them but um, because we need to check them in right away so they can be available for someone else. We've just been wearing gloves when we check them in and put them, uh, let them sit for an hour or two and then put them back on the shelf. Uh, we'll have to see what happens come fall and with more students and more things going in and out, we'll have to kind of play it by ear. The other thing I should say about what, Sorry, did I, I interrupted somebody. You can go in fully remote. Uh, you still have professors putting books on reserve in the physical library. Yes. Yes. We do. Well, that's, it's, that's partly a function of the fact that the seminary wants particular, the seminary wants those students who are in the area to feel welcome on campus. So that's part of it. The other part of it is that um, there are um, some of our faculty that um, think that unless you have a print book available for a student, the student can't get the information. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's a sort of generational faculty thing. The other thing I was gonna say is that we have, since the beginning of the pandemic, um, been working really hard to augment our electronic resources. Uh, we've been buying ebooks like crazy. Um, we are in the middle of a implementation of uh, EBSCO's discovery service, uh, which will pull all of our ebooks and our database materials together. Um, in the every cloud has a silver lining department. Um, I would say that I would never have been able to persuade the administration to give us the money for EDS or invest in things like JSTOR had the pandemic not come along. 
Um, so it, in that sense, it's been a blessing. Um, but it's, it's also, it's also very challenging and, you know, to, to take a library that, to take a curriculum that is, has been so heavily print based for so many years and transition it to one that is more electronic based, um, is an ongoing an ongoing challenge um so but that's that that's that's where we are um i don't think donna's had many people beating down the doors of the library since uh since we reopened and i'm not expecting that we're going to have huge numbers in um after labor day but but you never know um so that that's 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 where we are Andy, I got one more question. And remember, we're recording this. Did the OPC General Assembly vote that this was okay? <laughs> the answer. They, they, they set up a study committee. Yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. They'll get back to you in five years. Yep. Yeah. yeah they yeah. set up a study committee. The one thing that Donna was, has just been texting me to um, say that we have not talked about and we will talk about and we'll we'll get back to you on this is we haven't really talked about um, how we serve students from other institutions um, I mean off the top of my head I would say that anyone from any other institution is able to come and check out books from the library as normal so long as they have the proper SEPLA form um, study space could be an issue um, because we will need to limit study space. We need we will need to prioritize study space for Westminster students. Um, but Don and I will talk about that, and we can we can communicate what what we're going to do on that. So it that's might a, be that's a question. To... That's a question we haven't thought to to think about. So it wouldn't be amiss for us to recommend or contact you or recommend. No, this that's to fine. Yeah. You. Yeah, just e have people email library at wts.edu. That's fine. Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, in terms in terms of checking books out, right? That's well, fine. It's just well, if they need study space, they should they contact need study you. Space, they should email us. Yeah, that's okay. probably the best. That's the, the simplest thing to do. All right, good. Um, Westminster, is there any procedure students have to go? People, users have to go through to get on your campus? Like we have a no. There, no, there's not. Although what they do need to do is if they are external people, they do need to sign in when they come into the building. Um, they must wear a mask at all times when they're in the library. And there is lots of hand sanitizer in various places around the building. Um, Don, am I forgetting anything? We don't have a sign in sheet we, anymore. They put that oh, down. we don't. Okay. No. Right. But that's Sorry. what you and I were going to talk about yeah. using study yeah. space and having a sign it for yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. I, I should add um, two things um, that I didn't think of, but Sandy reminded me of is um, just students are coming in. We do have, um, you know, when they come in, um, Rachel is the circulation desk is right there and she's got one of those laser gun um, uh, temperature things. So there is sort of a <laughs> Anybody with a obvious fever isn't allowed in. You know, um, yeah. the other thing is is touching on sort of the the idea of uh, digital resources and course reserves. Um, one of the things that we've done, at least for the interim, is um, we had been so we're part of the DTL, which means we have um, the ability to request that materials be added to the DTL, um, and so we've we were only requesting um, items that we didn't already have. And we've started requesting items, uh, course reserve items, even if we have them in print, we've been add adding them, at requesting them as uh, digital as well for the DTL, if, if they're available by a GOBI. Um, so there's a number of things that aren't, but we are at least trying to uh, do that. Lydia masks on campus? Well, yeah, I mean, we're in Philadelphia, it's, yeah. I you can wear a mask. Kind of goes without saying. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Thank. That's. Any other questions? Anyone? I'm just trying to think of stuff that's coming off the top of my head from conversations we've had. 
Um, who wants to go next? So I'd like to just um, ask um, about the spreadsheet that we have available and keeping abreast of changes in our consortium. Um, um, uh, how is that going? Um, uh, are we keeping it up to date? I believe I updated it once we'd made the decision to and don't update it hours. Open. So is that, is that a, you know, uh, uh, going well then and in terms of you know, uh, if we have a, a, a student who finds there's material available at one of our institutions, it's uh, you know, worth checking that uh, spreadsheet. Oh, well, it looks like uh, it's worth pursuing or they're pretty much locked down entirely right now. It mightn't hurt for you to send around an email to the listserv just to remind people that it's there and ask them to make sure that it, their institution's updated. In the midst of everything else, it's easy to forget to do stuff like that. Yeah, and I think we're, we're finally settling on a date to be reopened to the public just now. So there's probably still some changes that people might have or, you know, additions that, that they might just be uh, coming to make right now. You guys move? Can you move, James? Uh, we're, oh, we're far from moving yet. Oh, okay. They're, they're, still, they're still planning, of course, but we're, we're actually uh, very, very much the opposite of uh, some of the libraries here right now. Uh, they, they were, uh, uh, they, they were determined to have all the students back on campus and to reopen and have business as usual. Uh, with some minor alterations uh, when fall came around, and that is what we are doing right now. Uh, so the, the students came back last week, uh, and everybody is back on campus. Uh, classes are going forward, and the library is open. We, we've been here actually since mid-June, uh, the library staff. There were no summer classes, but we're, we are, uh, you know, open to our are on campus students right now. We're still closed to the public, uh, but like I said, I think we're, we're, fi we're finally settling on a date. So, so when all the students came back last week, uh, St. Charles entered into what they called this two week quarantine. So while, while those of us, there's a few lay faculty and staff who are coming in and out, but uh, pretty much everybody who came on campus, all the students are here for two weeks uh, a lot of the faculty, the, the priest faculty live here. So most people are just, uh, hopefully we won't have any cases, won't have any problems. We, we, ha we don't seem to have had so far. And, uh, and then we'll continue on with the semester from there. Uh, what I'm thinking is I may reopen the library to the public to people from outside uh, at certain times of the day. So rather than it being open all day to both students and the public from the morning into the evening, the way it used to be, uh, there may just be certain times when I know that students aren't will be open to the public. That hopefully will uh, keep you know the students apart a bit from exposure to. So I'm set next week or the week after we'll probably make an announcement. We'll have it on the website. So in other words, St. Charles is almost like the, uh, they're trying to create almost like the, uh, the NBA or the NFL bubble kind of scenario. I think we lost them. With hope, the new I hope all goes as smoothly as possible at St. Charles uh, with that uh, basically full reopening. Uh, we'll, we'll be watching or listening with interest uh, and how that goes. Um, just to re go back to, and people can add this to their spiel as we go through, but for Westminster, St. Charles, um, you know, 
anything this summer that you learned that you like, hey, we needed to pivot here, we needed to do this, that, or the other? Not really, I'd say for us. Um, it seemed to work pretty well. Uh, I don't think really had any like a, you know, extra questions from students about accessing resources or complaints about um, being unable to get in touch with library staff or anything like that. It, it, for us, it went about as well as we could have hoped for. Okay. And Donna and Tiny, you guys were closed, right? You were just closed for the whole summer. Yeah, we were closed till the end, end of July, but Donna and one of the other staff were actually working in the building right. okay. um, for part of that time. Yep. Okay. But it wasn't open. No one could come in. Correct. No. Correct. Um, who wants to go next? So at New Brunswick, um, I can affirm we were closed. We were completely closed for some time. We actually had a um, HVAC failure and um, our offices are um, air conditioned. Um, and during the period that that was um, uh, getting pursued and installed, you know, we were closed entirely. Otherwise, um, uh, members of the library staff uh, have been sharing responsibility um, uh, for offering door side uh, pickup. Um, and mailing books out to our own students. Um, our undergraduate counterpart here is Rutgers University. Rutgers remains um, uh, closed for now. It's going to be reopening to allow a certain number of Rutgers only affiliates into the building um, at a time. And uh, so several um, uh, folks will not be uh, invited um, uh, to Rutgers during that reopening phase. And um, and we remain closed. We're in a phased um, reopening uh, plan. We're considering moving into phase two, which, which will mean that we continue to be closed. Um, there may be some opportunity for, for mailing books if you would just reach out to us. Uh, if you have a specific request, um, uh, we could facilitate, but uh, the building itself is closed to our own students uh, and faculty. Um, as well as our main academic building. Um, the common areas, conference rooms, and classrooms are all um, off limits to, to students and faculty. So um, we remain in a fairly um, uh, strict sort of quarantine atmosphere. Uh, I can affirm we've also been uh, doing a lot of ebook purchases. Our uh, uh, Public Services Librarian Laura Jacoby has been coordinating acquisitions um, of uh, ebooks using the uh, incentive from ProQuest uh, for purchasing ebooks recently. And uh, through Gobi, uh, things that we were, have not been able to uh, get unlimited licenses for through the DTL, which we also started using uh, basically when the pandemic started and then officially joined in July. So um, such a lifesaver for us. I don't know how we would have made it if we hadn't had the DTL. Um, yeah, uh, I've, I continue to get very good feedback from our, you know, our faculty using it for research purposes. Uh, Rutgers University, uh, um, like Princeton University has lots of database you know, resources that our faculty would love to have access to. Um, but uh, the DTL is a, it's a, it's a, it's a useful um, collection for, for what mean, we even couldn't get to previously. Yeah. Michelle uh, uh, Macy is our, um, our, our newest addition. She is our new digital services librarian, a recent graduate of Rutgers University with her MLIS and is on our call today. Um, would you like to say hello, Michelle? There you are. Uh, hi. <laughs> yes, I've been listening in, but um, yeah, I'm excited to be here. Um, so Michelle is doing cataloging and um, um, is responsible for serials and periodicals. Would you like to add anything? Did I miss things about what um, 
what was going on uh, in the summer, um, what is going on now? No, yeah, like you said, like we're just working through the phases. Um, Laura and I have been coordinating, like trying to get books out to students, like um, a lot of eBooks has really been the bulk of what we've been doing um, and trying to mimic the services they usually look for in digital platforms. So we've really been trying to scour the internet for different free resources and things that are offered digitally right now because of COVID. So yeah, it's pretty much what we've been trying to do. Well, welcome to Thank the group. Um, I think that's um, uh, uh, enough from New Brunswick uh, for the moment. Thanks. Go ahead if nobody else wants to. We have, uh, we were uh, closed uh, through the, the most, uh, the, uh, the spring semester, I guess, uh, as everyone else building was in fact closed. We reopened our building partially uh, early summer. Um, and uh, with that, the library remained closed, but I have been going in uh, for uh, a couple hours twice a week um, just to try to catch up and plan ahead for the semester. Um, what we've been doing basically is uh, handling any potential uh, borrowing requests or returns um, uh, through by appointment um, through a particular door. The library has a uh, private um, emergency door that we're able to use. Um, and we use a, a pass through with a box so nobody handles anything specifically. Um, since most of our students have not been here, uh, we really, I haven't had more than one or two people around. Um, we were planning on opening uh, for classes in the fall uh, hybridly, but since uh, we have decided to go fully digital, um, fully dis uh, distance learning, so um, we will not be having any in-house classes. And about, at least at this point, it seems like about 50% of our small student body um, are not returning to the Philadelphia area. And a large number of those who live in the area live uh, um, in West Philly or other places, not, since we're not residential, no one, very few people live near us. Um, the plans are for um, the library to be open. Uh, I will be going in full time and keeping regular hours um, the study space, as others have mentioned, is severely limited, um, and uh, we will have a very small occupancy footprint. Um, I, I think a lot of what we're doing is what everybody else has said they've been doing so far. Uh, I'm the only staff person, so I'm handling everything, so uh, we're not working on any great speed. Uh, uh, we're still we're doing ILLs, so if people need ILLs, uh, we are handling that um, as normal. Um, what else? Um, we will be mailing mailing books out to our students uh, who are outside of the area, or anybody who who prefers not to come in to pick up books. Or and uh, so we will probably be doing a lot more. Um, mailing of resources. Um, that's about all I can think of. That not that much difference. I mean, like I said, we have a very, we have a small student body of about 40 students. Um, and probably half will be in the area. And I honestly don't expect very many people coming in to use the library, uh, certainly for studying. Um, and maybe not even for borrowing resources, but we'll, we'll see. We're sort of playing it as it goes within the, uh, the guidelines. We will be doing full compliance with masks and, uh, and distancing and lots of cleaning and lots of wiping and spraying, and all of that.
Who wants to jump in now? I'm happy to jump in from Princeton Seminary. Um, our uh, building is closed um, and will remain closed through the end of the calendar year, possibly beyond, but no decision on that yet. Um, the, we had our book drop uh, open at the end of the semester uh, in late May for the return of books, but our, and those books were quarantined before being reshelved, but the book drop is, is closed uh, since that time. Um, some staff have been able to enter the building on, on sort of an ad, as needed basis, an ad hoc basis, um, with arranging that with, uh, with the cleaning crew and security um, I'm told we are very close to having our reopening plan approved, but when I say reopening, that's just staff um, coming in on a regular basis, um, specified staff to perform their work. Um, we're not uh, providing ILL. Um, for reserves, um, that's mostly being handled by um, internal staff scanning um, articles or book chapters. Um, and then the collection development librarian is purchasing ebooks for classes wherever possible. So the idea is to, you know, if there's, if there's something actually on the, on the reading list, on the syllabus for any given class, um, trying to acquire that electronically um, and having enough copies for all students uh, registered in that, in that course. When I, say, when I say the building is closed, I should clarify that we do have the front of the building open, uh, which means the foyer, the cafe, and a small meeting room and a large meeting room. And that area, is gated off from the rest of the library. And so that space is being used as a study space um, for PTS community only. Um, it, it adds up to perhaps a dozen study spaces, um, each socially distanced. Uh, of course, masks are required for that and masks are required um, in the building for when staff are in the building, unless you are uh, by yourself in an office. Anything um, I've overlooked? So you're saying then, um, Greg, that uh, there's some space that's open, but it's not open to the public. That's right. That was student couldn't come over to Princeton and borrow something at this point. That's right. Um, we're not actually, well, we're not lending to our own students either. Uh, but yeah, the study space in the front of the library is only open to PTS students. Do you have a, I have a date in mind when you may be, when you may start lending material again? Um, no, my understanding is that the building will be closed and uh, materials won't be going out. Well, there is one exception to the materials going out. Um, but no, uh, the, through the end of the year, um, the building will be closed. The exception that I should have mentioned to lending out materials is that we um, have and have had for mm, a few weeks um, curbside pickup service for PhD students and faculty there uh, from PTS. There's been some talk of expanding that to PTS master's students, uh, but that has not happened. And as far as I know, hasn't been decided upon yet. We, yeah, we did that back, we did that at Westminster starting, was it June we did started that Donna? 
something like that for yeah. PhD and PHM students. And we had, um, and there was a fair bit of interest in it at the beginning. Um, but I think we were, I don't think we were overrun by requests for it. No. Mm -mm. I don't know the rate of usage on the curbside pickup, but I know that we've got um, one, one staff member working on that only part of the time. So right. it mustn't be too demanding. Micah, what's going on at LTS? So at Lancaster Seminary, we have tried to keep going as best we can through the different phases that Pennsylvania has been through. Um, for those of you in New Jersey, you may know about our colored coded phases here in Pennsylvania. Um, so even though our county is in green, um, and I have a green plan all ready to go. Our administration at the seminary was not quite ready for the whole campus to go green. Uh, so where we are right now is we're observing a chartreuse phase, which is between yellow and green. Um, Has that been approved by Governor Wolf? The chartreuse phase? Okay. All right. Lines with what he wants. So yeah. anyway, um, you know, we have we have to do what we can to bring bring some humor to the situation, right? Yes. Yep. So um, so anyhow, basically, we are still closed to the public. Um, we do have. Um, you have to have a, a key fob to get into our building. And that has been true throughout the whole, the whole pandemic. Um, we have an after hours access program for our students. Um, they can apply to be in the program to receive a fob that gives them access to our building between 6 a.m. and midnight, uh, seven days a week, except for seminary holidays. Uh, so, we were, there was a, a period of um, mo July and most of August when those students, uh, their fobs were not active. Um, but our classes started up on uh, Friday evening, this past Friday, our day classes started today. Uh, so that after hours access is kicking back in again. So those students who are in that program are able to access the building and I'll be um, setting up um, Setting up the um, Sorry, I'm getting distracted by Lydia's dog um, <laughs> Yeah, he's standing here moaning at me even though he was just outside 10 minutes ago, so oh. Hence me disappearing and reappearing is because of him. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyhow, I'll be setting up um, the stuff for new students to be able to sign up for that program if they want to get a FOB uh, to get access to the building. So our um, maintenance staff has been prioritizing the library um, as far as cleaning and sanitizing surfaces and whatnot. And uh, so that's how we're able to um, permit students to continue to use the library, even though we're closed to the public. Uh, we have a um, contact free checkout service that we're offering. Um, we started out while we were in yellow phase that was only available to faculty, staff and students. We've opened that up to anyone with a library account. So um, students from your institutions, if they already have a library account with us, um, can go ahead and put holds on items and uh, come by to check them out. Um, well, we check them out for them and then they're sitting outside at the time that they specify that they're going to pick them up. 
if you've got folks who don't already have an account with us, um, the best way would be uh, probably for you as librarians to email either me or email library at uh, and copy that student so that um, you know you can vouch for their connection to your um, institution so that you know kind of in the place of our septal form um, you know I, I'm okay just accepting an email and then I'll um, you know set up an account for them and then they can um, log in and put holds on items in our catalog and arrange to pick them up for a checkout. Uh, our classes are online. We, we made an announcement that our, our classes are going to be all online through the end of our second term, which is mid-February. Uh, we have our, we're on a three term schedule. So our third term is late February through the end of April. It's 10 weeks. Um, personally, um, what I'm seeing right now with the projections for a vaccine, um, I don't think it's likely that our administrators are going to, um, are going to see that we're ready to reopen for 10 weeks. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of operating on the assumption that we're going to be in this chartreuse phase um, <laughs> through, through the end of the, you know, through this academic year. Um, course reserves are um, a bit tricky. We, um, I've gone through and, and purchased ebook licenses where possible. Sounds like, you know, what you all are doing too. Um, linked those in the catalog. Um, we did not, so I still have course reserve lists in our catalog, but we are not, I did not pull them out and make them special course reserves for hourly loan like we normally do. So they're all still in the stacks and they're all gonna circulate for the standard amount of time that a regular book would circulate. So that would be 30 days for most of our master's students. Um, we will, you know, because of the holds process and whatnot, um, you know, I, we can monitor if people put holds on books and then, you know, recall things that are in high demand, anything that we have to recall that's on hold for someone else, we intend to quarantine for 72 hours. Um, but pretty much everything else that's circulating, our circulation is just not at a level where we need to worry about people handling a book um, in close succession. So for those items, we just put them back on the shelf and um, trust that they'll be there for more than 72 hours. Uh, what else? Um, yeah, I think um, Seems like there was something else that I was going to touch on, but I can't remember. Oh, ILL, Interlibrary Loan. We, um, so we are uh, lending and receiving um, ILLs. I turned that back on in June. I've adjusted our uh, response time to eight days. Um, so because of some of the staffing um, changes that we've had at our library, I'm the one that's doing interlibrary loan now, and I'm only in the library about once a week. So um, I'm going in once a week to do ILLs and other things. So um, I can ship out and receive about once a week. And that, seem, that seems to be working well so far. Um, I've, um, you know, I do, when we get requests, I do go in and mark things considering so that the library knows we're, we're working on that. Um, but that's, that's what we are, that's what we're doing at Lancaster Seminary. Clint, are you still there? Or did you have to step out? I was going to have Clint fill us in on LBC, but I guess I'll do it. 
Um, so we, uh, LBC is unique in this whole group because we have on ground undergrads. And so they, that's really, I think what push, that's what's pushing return to typical classes uh, is, is to keep the on ground, the on, to keep the traditional undergrads coming. Uh, grad students are less concerned about the college experience. So I, I would hope. And so uh, we're not allowing anybody on campus unless you're uh, faculty, staff, or um, student. Uh, and it's a pretty, um, <clears throat> it's a pretty stringent process um, for us, we have to fill out a, an online survey, an app. Uh, so there's a survey about our health, take our temperature before we leave, to come to work. Uh, when we get to campus, we need to show them the app that we've done it. Then they take our temperature uh, and then we can go to our offices. Um, you have to wear a mask uh, when you're in any building, uh, obviously when you're in your office by yourself uh, and outside even if you can't socially distance. Um, Clint, <laughs> if I forgot something, just chime in. Um, so we're not able to do, we can't allow anybody on campus who's not from our place, which is pretty standard now at a lot of undergrad. Is Franklin and Marshall kind of doing the same thing, Micah? I, yes, I believe so. Um, they're certainly not allowing anyone in their buildings who are not Franklin and Marshall students, but. Yeah, I talked to someone at Messiah, they're doing the same thing. So, um, so what we're doing with our uh, materials is we've closed the stacks. We're not allowing students to roam the stacks. Um, what we're re re preferring is that they put their books on hold through the catalog and then we pick them up. Um, uh, and, uh, obviously if somebody comes in, we can still go back. One of our staff can go and grab something and bring that to them, but we're encouraging them to do that. Uh, our reference, we're going to try to encourage as much of that as possible through appointment through zoom. Uh, and this is for faculty and staff, faculty and students. Um, again, I, I think a lot of students who walk in. Our li if you haven't been to LBC, uh, it's, it's, it's really just integrated. Our library is so integrated with the rest of the campus because uh, we have two floors, but in the building there's classroom space. So there'll be students coming, people coming through our building who aren't even using the library. They're just going to class uh, on, a, on a different floor. We're using the tutoring services on a different floor. So we can't control that very much as far as the flow that way. Uh, but we have all the... Uh, the plastic plexiglass up in front of all the, the desks and all that type of thing. Um, we are able to do interlibrary loan. Um, we're able to do that. Uh, we're able to fill requests for CEPLA. At this point, Clint, I don't think we have any restrictions on how many staff can be in the building or anything like that because it's just a public building. You know, it's just a public building. Uh, so, and we all have our own offices, so we can still kind of go in and shut the door and take the mask off do what we're going to do. Um, Mark? Yeah. Um, all the classrooms have been rearranged so that everyone's socially distanced. So there are uh, uh, limitations there. And then I think I noticed they, the maintenance even put up some plexiglass on some of our study tables. Um, but I don't think we're going to, we don't want a lot of that. We'd really rather you get your materials and and move on. But like I said, because it's, uh, it's a high traffic area, I mean, it's, it's, it's really hard to, the only thing we were able to do is kind of rope off the stacks. Uh, but a lot of the, you know, the front part of the library, anybody can walk through, they could just be walking to class. Uh, so we, we were, we returned to campus uh, two weeks ago. Um, and so we, we have some people who are working remote because of, uh, they're considered high risk uh, for health conditions, so we are not at full staff every day in the building, but full staff either in the building or remote. Um, 
again, lots of uh, cleaning supplies, lots of cleaning high touch areas. We also have a lot of student workers, so we're having them doing a lot of cleaning and grabbing those. We are quarantining all the books for 72 hours. Um, we have the drop-off window. I mean, that's an interesting idea, Clint, that came up. Somebody said that they're making all the returns through the drop through the drop uh, window. So that's 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 one way. Um, am I missing anything, Clint, as far as what we're doing? Well, we are. Um, doing course reserves, but we're not inviting faculty to give us lists like we have in the past. So those books that, that the staff know already will be um, high demand. We're placing them on reserve, but, um, and it's a, a checkout system, a, a non-touch, um, and before we, we give the re reserve book to a student, um, we, we tell them they, they have to agree to sanitize their hands and keep their mask on while they're reading the book in the library. So we're not allowing any reserve books to be taken out, um, but just to remain in the library. And on the cover of the reserve book, there will be a uh, it, a notice that this book may not be quarantined if people, you know, just so that they know someone may have taken off their mask without us knowing it or whatever. So we're doing that. And um, for reference books, since we have a, a KIC scanner that allows the students to scan essays in reference books, we're doing, we're treating those the same way use the hand sanitizer. There's a station right there for them to use. Um, and then we give them the reference book and they can scan whatever and then they just deposit it back at the circulation desk. Um, we are not quarantining those, those two uh, formats, with course reserves and reference book material. Um, I think those are a few things. Um, that's, that's interesting to hear about the the reserve books because I that was a question I had for the group it sounds like a lot of you don't have you know students who are on campus who are using the reserve books a lot but we we too are doing the quarantine the 72 hour quarantine for books that are returned but uh, I, I wondered what people were doing about reserve books especially if you know they, they could be used in succession by different people. I guess just putting a little sign on them, warning them, uh, you know, warning a student that it may have been handled is uh, that, that, that might dissuade some people who, who perhaps know they're more vulnerable from using it. But I was thinking, like in our case, if I know something is going to be used a lot, I usually encourage the teacher to make a scan you know, of a chapter or something to put on their their uh, Populi page. Um, and I've been encouraging teachers to do that, but we're still, we still have everything on reserve for, for for students to use if they, you know, if they so need it. Yeah, we've been trying, we, we've been doing so it's trying to encourage faculty to use as many ebooks as possible for their courses, even their textbooks. Um, you know, having them send us in uh, their course list, books list early so we can check Gobi and see if they're available. Um, Clint and I've run into this. This is just a good, I, Clint and I just had this conversation today, but sometimes if you're using books from your, uh, your uh, subscription, like the EBSCO book subscription or ProQuest book subscription, sometimes you run into situations there where they a book that a professor has assigned, all of a sudden EBSCO takes it off the, uh, off the list of available books and oops, nobody can get to it. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we've been more proactive in trying to purchase our own copies of those particular titles like that. Uh, would probably be the same for reserve books and things like that. So yeah, that, I guess it's almost like Netflix. Like it's all of a sudden you're into a show and then they say, oh, we're not gonna, you know, we're not gonna have it anymore, right? It's the same kind. Any one of those services you have, you can have that. So, um, 
So that's that's been we were we kind of went back and forth, Clint, on reserves. We weren't really sure what to do with that. Um, but the fact that we're dealing with undergraduates that we, you know, so far they've not exactly turned out to be the most reliable people for social distancing and preventing coronavirus. So it's uh, it's it's a, it's such a different animal than when you're dealing with graduate students. And we've um, we've tried to discourage the faculty by reminding them that. We could go remote by the end of September if if there's uh, spikes in in the COVID on campus, and so that will help no one if those books are only available on reserve. So the ones that we do have on reserve, we we really just have them out of convenience for the student if they want to read them in the library. But in in the faculty have been they've really. Uh, taken that to heart. We have very few people who have tried to put something on reserve. What was really nice with us, they, uh, because we knew this was going on, the, uh, the provost at our school set up a summer institute to provide training for faculty on online education. Um, one, because they knew there were going to be some hybrid courses and just preparing for the pivot. So stuff didn't happen the way it did in the spring. And uh, they gave us a section of that. So we were able to kind of do some instruction on how to use the library for online instruction, online teaching, uh, how to use resources that way, how to request them. And it's, it seems that it's really paid off. It's really paid off in that regard. A lot of professors have, uh, to the point where, you know, they're emailing us and saying, you know, did I get my links right in my, in my, uh, in my Canvas page or my learning management page? So, yeah, that was really good. Um. At New Brunswick, we've, we've been doing um, something similar with our dean uh, suggesting that faculty check the library collections, EBSCO, ProQuest, the Digital Theological Library for the availability of books um, in advance of planning their syllabi um, because, you know, we've been under executive order to be closed. You know, um, for months in the summer, all libraries in New Jersey. Um, we're still under an executive order from the governor for staff uh, to be no, no greater than 25% of the staff um, uh, in the building at a time. So um, the uh, uh, reserve lists that we returned you know, for students basically included links you know, for eBooks and books that weren't available uh, uh, digitally, the expectation is that students would purchase them uh, uh, themselves. Uh, in the uh, unusual cases where a book is out of print or particularly hard to get, um, uh, we've been considering something along the lines of controlled you know, uh, digital lending, but aren't really there yet. Just to add on to that too, I know Laura Jacoby, um, who her internet cut out, but she wanted me to mention that um, we curated these um, digital book lists to kind of help students and professors um, list uh, linking to the ebooks either on EBSCO or ProQuest or the DTL. And where we couldn't find things like that, we would link to Internet Archive or Project News, or we really just did the research for them kind of to kind of lead them in the right direction um, to access things online and also cut back on the need for the physical books while we're still remote. So that was a big help as well. Yeah, I should, um, that's something that we already been doing. So I think that's for us was one of the reasons that we had such a smooth transition to being purely digital is um, we'd already, because I do all of the, I build the course pages for every course. Um, I was already going in adding the course lists. So, and uh, highlighting whenever we had the eBooks um, so a little time consuming on the front end, but it's really saved us a lot of time, I think, sort of on the, in the longer term when, because everything was already set up, like, sort of accidentally set up for what wound up happening, but you know, it was good. I have found out, and, and this is more for, since we're recording this, I just wanted to put this out there, and this is more for uh, probably our colleagues who deal with undergraduates. So Karen, Moravian, um, I can't think of anybody else right off the top of my head other than us. Um, but 
a lot of times you, have, you really do have to talk with your provost or your dean about encouraging faculty to use the ebooks as their textbooks because, and I have to admit ignorance on this one, did not know this, uh, some schools do make revenue off of selling textbooks. And so what happens is, you know, you, you come up with this great idea, but it, it, if it's not thought through, uh, then the revenue gets involved. And they're like, well, we, you know, if, if, if we're going to provide the book for free, one, we're, we're paying for that, and we're not making revenue off of either renting or selling the textbooks. So that's just something that I, Clint and I had, I don't, Clint, I didn't know that. And when we pitched that idea and we met with the head of our bookstore who was up for it, he just said that we need to plan that out in such a way that, that there's, not an, there's not somewhere that the school is expecting to make revenue off of the sale of books. And then all of a sudden students aren't buying them and they're coming through the library. Um, sure. I don't know if that's the case at Westminster or not, because I know you guys do have the bookstore. So I don't know if that's um, yeah, but the bookstore, well, I mean, the bookstore will make some revenue based on sales, but they're, I, I, the, the vast majority of the Westminster bookstore now is doing sales, I think, outside of seminary students. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. I mean, we don't have, we haven't had a physical bookstore on campus for years. And we don't even have a warehouse now there. It's all internet based and we're using a warehouse somewhere out in, near Pittsburgh, I think. Okay. The other question I had for anybody, I keep seeing this in my social media feed that ProQuest has been advertising, like digitize your collection. Has anyone seen anything about this? Have anyone seen advertisements from ProQuest on this? I mean, the way they're marketing it, it sounds like, you know, you can... I guess if you own the book or something, you, they can digitize it. I haven't looked at it real closely, but I was just curious. I just keep seeing advertisements for it. No, I haven't seen that. So I'm guessing it's the, um, was it the, the idea of you have your, cause your collection is locked down and nobody has access to it, but you're still, you can have one digital copy available sort of I think that's, um, that seems like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but we, I've seen some of that um, on the internet archive. But. Right, right, and that's generally where I think you're giving them your collection, right? That's what evangelicals did. They, they, they gave their collection to internet archives and then they scan it and they make it available, whatever they decide. This seems more like, and, and I've seen more advertisements for it in the last six months simply because I think of what we're all going through. So I was just curious if anyone else is, uh, somehow they've, they've gotten into my Facebook feed. So I, I don't know. I, uh, I mean, it would be very, it would be very interesting to know the copyright implications of all of that. Yeah. But, um, is that true that if you own a book, you can make one digital copy and that's not a copyright infringement? As long as the print, so the idea, if I understand correctly, this is from a webinar I attended like four months ago, so. The details are foggy, but yeah. the idea is basically when you purchase the print book, you are in essence purchasing access to that book's contents, you know, one use, single use. Mm -hmm. So if you have your books shut away so that you can guarantee nobody's having physical access to them, you can then make um, an equivalent number of copies available digitally as long as you control. So it's like only one person can, I have one copy, so only one uh -huh. person can access the copy at a time. I have two copies, so two people can access it at a time. That, that sort of oh. thing. If I and, is that, and does that presuppose that the physical copies are unavailable? So if you- Yes, they have to be unavailable. That's the whole sort of gimmick, how, how it works. So if I lock it up in my desk. Yeah. That counts. That counts. Okay. That counts. okay. I think it's good to know. I don't know. Don't trust me. I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I don't know. I mean, the, 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 you know, the one, one of the things that, what, one of the, I mean, there, there's been a lot of, the Internet Archive has gotten themselves into some hot legal water they have. Uh, since COVID. And so unless there's a copyright lawyer on this call, I, I'm... I, I'm I'm ner I'm a little nervous of all of this stuff, um, so. I 
I suspect also some of it has to do with the scope of it. So the Internet Archive is so big and publicly available mm. that it's going to draw different sort of scrutiny and has a different sort of um, weight yeah. resting on it, sort of in terms of fair use versus, you know, a small seminary that's, you know, not, you're not advertising yourselves. It's generally only available to you and maybe a few, you know, sort of, uh, consortial libraries. Otherwise, it's not, yeah, that's not going to draw the same level of scrutiny. It's not going to hold the same sort of question of, is this bumping past fair use and sort of negatively affecting the publisher's revenues and all that sort of stuff. Um, but that's what it rests on. I think is Mark or um, have you been getting um, content or letters from uh, the DTL about, I, th I think this is one something that they're starting to experiment with, but I'm not sure I haven't, I have like a whole pile of things from the DTL uh, that I haven't had a chance to to look at just because I've got, um, you know, beginning of semester stuff I'm trying to deal with. But I thought something along those lines, maybe that they were talking about, but. I've, I've heard from some of my moles that uh, DTL is considering their own interlibrary loan system. Okay. So, uh, I, I haven't heard that. I understand that they are um, moving moving forward with a plan to have their own ILL system and are um, exploring very seriously getting into controlled digital lending. Um, so, um, yeah. Did you uh, you uh, dropped uh, out at the very end of that sentence. Controlled digital lending. Okay. Um, yeah. Do any, do any of you know whether DTL has given any thought to changing the terms of reference for their membership uh, in terms of full-time equivalent students um, because we've always been slightly above their cutoff so I've never been able to invest. Um, Danny, I know, I know what I do know is that something must be afoot because Evangelical Seminary who merged with Sioux Falls Seminary and is part of this Kairos network which has a a significant, um, a significant FTE when you factor in all the schools they're involved with uh, is part of this now. They're part of DTL. Um, what I, I get, it was his Phil, right? Philip? The, the, Tom, the, Thomas. Tom oh, Phillips. Oh, yeah, Tom, that's it. And one of the things I chatted, because he had always years ago, he had always said that it was a, uh, there's a ceiling, right? Mm -hmm. the, ETL is viewed as a 3,000 FTE school or something like that. 4,000. 4,000, yeah, okay. And so, and once he hit that, he's done, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know if he's been able to renegotiate that to make space with this Kairos network. I don't know if the Kairos network is going to start their own thing, but that's something that I did chat about with some people here. It's not unrealistic to think about creating our own DTL. Yeah. yeah, I think Tom would probably encourage that. Um, yeah, I mean, from what I understand um, from the last uh, board meeting for the detail, which was two months ago, I think. Yeah. April. Uh, so, yeah, we're due one in September. So, yeah, it was a few months ago. Um, he was in talks with a couple schools that would basically, if they sign on, that will basically hit the cap. Mm -hmm. um, and I That's think Irish. part of it is that there's some kind of, he's built in a little bit of wiggle room so that as FTE flexes throughout all the schools, we're not going to suddenly explode past the limit and get the publishers mad at us. Yeah, because um, yeah, yeah, when I have, because when I had my last communication with him, which I'm just trying to find and I can't find it, but it, like it's like seven or eight months ago, long before all this happened, it's probably a year ago. And because it was at the point at which he was sort of advertising DTL on Atlantis. And when I corresponded with him, he simply said, sorry, you push us way beyond our limits, so we can't help you. So, um, but if, if they're thinking of raising their limits, um, there are a lot of sort of middle, middle 
enrollment size schools like Westminster, for example, that would really benefit from it. Yeah, I think I think when I talked to Tom before I left Evangelical last year about this was, I said, if Steplow was interested in something like that, would you help coach us through that? And he said, absolutely. You know, if you wanted me to meet with you guys on Zoom, I would tell you how I did it, what I did. Um, so, I mean, that's that option's still on the table. He's never, I, I still assume he would have that conversation with us. And I would, yeah, I would think so, especially if you know, the detail's about to hit its ceiling. I was, I, yeah. I think he, he sees this sort of encourage, I mean, you know, he's been working on the, um, the, the open access DTL, the global DTL for, um, yeah. you know, poverty stricken countries. I think he would totally see, all right, DT, let's do DTL too, you know, <laughs> yeah. let's find another batch of schools and help them spin this up and, and get everything set up. And, you know, well, and I he, think he sees that kind of as his mission is to kind of encourage this approach to, for smaller schools um, towards. Yeah. Uh, I think that's, I think that's right. Yeah. Um, so when New Brunswick was considering this, um, our, our faculty you know, took up the question, should we try to create our own? Um, should we um, should we do um, um, do this, you know, uh, uh, legwork ourselves and do it now, um, or should we try to jump into the DTL while there's you know still time, so to speak? My understanding is that the cap is four thousand uh, FTEs. That the licenses are all negotiated for forty four hundred. So that's the wiggle room that you know, mm -hmm. uh, he works right, with. So he's got 400 built in as the breathing room. That makes sense. Um, and but really no interest in expanding the cap on that. Um, but rather, as it's been mentioned, um, encouraging others and sharing you know, uh, of the workflows that he's used to get this set up and in, the, in a general spirit of resource sharing. Um, and uh, and so uh, our faculty decided to, to join the DTL simply because um, we could do it then. We were already thinking of going completely remote before the pandemic hit and, and needing, and our eBook resources were paltry, you know, uh, uh, as of you know, early spring. Um, and having, having a way to just uh, um, you know, to flip a switch and have you know, a multitude of resources that we could start using, that was the decision we made. To join the DTL, but we, we you know we wondered aloud about um, about doing otherwise. It's it was really came down to a matter of um, do we reinvent the wheel um, or do we jump in this you know uh, uh, while we can. We decided to jump in while we can, but that certainly doesn't mean that New Brunswick wouldn't be interested in being part of uh, borrowing you know, strategies you know, uh, from the DTL. You know the. You know, from what I've read about SEPLA in years past and you know, union yeah, lists of periodicals that we've had, there has been incredible collaboration and resource sharing and, and, um, and heavy lifting that have been, it's been done by our member libraries you know, uh, for we the sake of sharing our resources. Yeah. I just don't see any reason why we couldn't um, uh, uh, harness some of that legacy and energy um, uh, towards something, you know, our, of a separate version of, of a DTL mm -hmm. or something like that. Yeah, and it might be something to kind of talk about more now that um, the ceiling has either been hit or is about to be hit for the DTL. I'm trying to say, all right, if we've got, it, A, if if the one schools that are currently in the DTL, you know, pulled out and joined the SEPLA group, it would open up some spots for other schools that might not have, um, I don't know, a consortial group that they could conceivably um, work with. I think the main thing is that the reason that the DTL exists is because Tom is one of those people that, you know, is able to folk, have a goal and just focus on bowling through anything to kind of get to that goal. And I think um, one of the things that we've kind of struggled with with SEPLA is everybody's so short staffed that that's just not feasible at, at this time, certainly. And um, we don't have, don't seem to have anybody, you know, an individual who's like, all right, this is going to be my thing that I'm going to take up and we're going to figure out how to make this work for our group of schools. Um, I mean, 
we'd love to, you know, to be working with sort of our, our group of, of libraries as opposed to a group that's sort of very far flung. If, if nothing else, it would make the board meetings a lot easier to schedule <laughs> if we didn't have uh, schools in, in, uh, in Netherlands. And I think, I don't know, like there's, there's one in, the, yeah. out in the Pacific somewhere. Um, I don't yeah. remember which island, but yeah. So it's, you know, kind of sort of odd times and it does make sort of communication on the committees and everything a little difficult, but. I, I think one of the things Clint and I have been talking about is we're, we're affiliated with, uh, we're not affiliated with ATS uh, at LBC. We're affiliated with ABHA, which is, um, what is that Clint? Association of Bible Colleges of Higher Ed or something like that. It's all, all the Bible colleges. And uh, some of these schools are exactly what Tom had in mind. These are these 100 FTE schools um, and, and, and it, with zero library budget. Uh, and I mean, when I was evangelical, I think when I first went into, into DTL, I think we had about 115 FTE. So we weren't a big drain on them uh, for what we paid we received significantly more than we could have ever imagined prior to that. And so what Clint and I have talked about is, would it be worth us having a conversation with some of these ABHE schools, uh, as well as say a group like SEPLA to say, okay, let's, could we get a 4,400 FTE group together? Um, the, the other thing is though, for, for some of the, for a school like ours, and Karen would be in this position and Moravian would be in this position is we couldn't really put all of our eggs in that basket because we need more than just theological resources. So, you know, we have to purchase business resources. You know, every time the provost wants a new program, whether it's uh, pre-law or business or whatever, we have to make sure we have the resources for that. Some of the resources transcend, other times we have to buy individual packages, but uh, there's nothing saying we couldn't certainly be part of DTL, uh, but we would have to, it would have to financially work out for a school like ours or Karen's or Moravian's where they still had enough money to purchase their non-theological stuff as well, where I didn't have to think about that at Evangelical. You don't have to think about that at Missio or New Brunswick. Right. Uh, well, uh, that might, yeah, that would definitely be something that would be worth discussing is sort of something that's like the DTL, but has a different focus because it is, you know, sort of some of the core constituents are multidiscipline undergrad schools. Yeah, have, or, you could, or we could just have a CEPLA DTL or whatever we want to call it. And we, you know, we as a school could think about financially being able to be part of that for, to take the place of these other resources, as long as the cost worked out so that we still had money in our budget for these other areas, right? So the collection mm -hmm. development even, is going to be for theological studies, church history, Bible, things like that. We need to have stuff that we can buy education books and buy psychology books and, and things like that as well. We, uh, we at New Brunswick do buy a lot of social justice and African-American studies you know, books, uh, mm -hmm. et cetera, and are completely in the midst of it, you know, apart from the detail now. Right. Um, it is 3.30, um, yeah. and we had uh, uh, talked about a 3.30 um, end time. I am energized uh, uh, to see you all. Um, uh, I appreciate it. It's been enlightening for me uh, to hear what you all have been doing. I've heard, um, uh, I've heard approaches to, to library services during the pandemic that I um, had not heard or read about elsewhere uh, on this call. So this has been, this has been useful. Um, at least to me. And, um, and apart from that, just seeing you all, uh, uh, several, several faces and voices that haven't um, had a chance to enter, interact with since our spring meeting was canceled. It's good to see you um, and, uh, and hear, hear about how you're delivering library services today. Um, we do plan, uh, the executive committee has, has um, met and discussed having a virtual fall meeting um, and so be on the lookout for um, information um, uh, and asking you for information about that. Um, one of the tangents of our conversation today had to do with resource sharing 
um, along the lines of a digital theological library. Um, and so perhaps for a continuing education component at a future uh, a meeting, we could uh, invite uh, Tom Phillips or Drew Baker from, from the DTL to you know, uh, tell us a little bit about how they did it. Um, uh, That's an excellent and, idea. Yeah. And, see, yep. and, and see if we can't um, uh, take some of that um, into consideration uh, 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 for us you know, to think about you know, something something like that. Um, are there any final thoughts? I just want to thank everybody. You have solved uh, that, that discussion about copyright and electronic copy. You solved a really big problem that I've been going through this week. And uh, you're going to make a couple of people really happy with your answer. So <laughs> thanks for that. that. That made the whole session worthwhile. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mark, for uh, suggesting this and for hosting. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Let's keep That's in touch it. and keep the spreadsheet up to date and uh, and look for some emails to our SEPTA list serve. Right. Right. See everybody. Bye. Go in peace. Bye. Bye. Bye.